Very, very early morning for you. All right. Sean, Henrik, Andres, good to see you guys. Almost see you anyway. There you go, Henrik. Top of the morning. Hey, Sandra. Morning. Hope all is good there with you guys. Excellent. Good. All right. Since we're right into the schedule here, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, again, good morning, uh, everyone. And of course, some of you, it's probably uh, evening. It depends on where you are right now. Not too many people from the US. I don't think anybody else from North America will be here. Uh, it is two in the morning, so that's probably a little bit tough for them. Although you never know, some people might prefer that time. So it could be uh, possible that those people are there as well. Okay, um, real quick, we'll take a look at the uh, slide you're seeing now, the Global Data Summit. Um, thanks to our more recent uh, activities with COVID, of course, our uh, conferences have not been held uh, in person for a bit. Um, we're now just going to be following through with a few more uh, sessions through Global Data Summit that will be based on uh, doing these kind of virtual series events. Um, so if you recall, those of you that have been with us before, um, we have this uh, topics kind of listing of things that cover with Global Data Summit. This one will be touching on things like fast data, ensemble modeling, the ELM or ensemble logical modeling uh, aspects of it, um, logical data warehouse, uh, which also I think touches on things, of course, like virtualization, and then some of the uh, deployments related to uh, big data and cloud. Um, with us today, we're going to have Antoine Selma and also Philip Domain with CDG, Connected Data Group. Uh, the sponsor for the series we have here is Single Store. And uh, yeah, without wasting any more time here, we can start to get into, uh, into that. I will give you a brief idea of how the schedule will work today. So we'll start off with the presentation. Uh, after the presentation is finished, we'll have some Q&A. Please use the chat box to ask any questions along the way. When we get to the Q&A section, at that time, we will then be able to um, you know, address your questions. You can also, of course, ask uh, real time when we get to the end of the presentation as well. But if you think of something, please use the chat box. Um, we will then have a, uh, after the Q&A, have a, have a brief session also with Single Store. Uh, to explain a little bit how the enabling technologies work. And then following that, we're going to break into three breakout rooms. The breakout rooms will be continued discussion with Antoine and Philip in room one, additional information on single store in room two, and then about Global Data Summit and other topics. Uh, also, uh, myself and John will be there, and that's in room three. So now we can uh, kick off. Uh, Laura? One moment. Okay. Can you see my screen, Hans? Uh, yeah, perfect. It is up. So, okay. So, welcome to the session about uh, getting from data roots to assemble logical modeling. 
Uh, it's presented by myself and Philip Demain, and it's part of our research and implementation that we have done over the, well, the, the last years uh, and working closely together with Genesee Academy and Single Store to uh, actually uh, build all those components uh, together. So the agenda for today is a, um, an introduction to the concept of data routes. Um, we also want to tell you why we use single store for data processing and data storage. And uh, the concept, of course, of the virtual ensemble logical modeling. Um, and we did some implementation uh, where we used data virtualization and we used single store. Um, what we will do in the breakout rooms <clears throat> is share our lessons learned um, and also uh, show you three use cases that we have implemented um, and, and uh, made available for our customers. And the slide deck will be available for all our attendees. So a little bit about myself. My name is Antoine Stelma. I'm from the Connected Data Group. I'm the co-founder and the lead architect. Um, most of you who know me, I have an extensive background of more than 20 years. I've uh, been a teacher for data fault, data modeling. Um, I'm actually loving the, the data modeling and I'm now involved in creating uh, data analytical environments, which uh, of course perform really well, uh, but also have a, a, a deep uh, way of modeling, uh, which is necessary for a, a, a speedy environment. Philip? Are you there, Philip? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, Philip Duman. I'm working in the, the data world since 2001, uh, having done uh, uh, multiple roles within, uh, within uh, different organizations. Um, and the last couple of years, mainly focusing on uh, modeling and data virtualization. So that's in short. Okay, thank you. So um, if we dive into uh, our quest, uh, our, our research and, and what we have uh, learned from our customers and, and implemented with them is actually how do we deliver data specific for analytics? So data should be integrated, it should be properly governed and it should be quick to adjust. And especially that part is making sure that you have a short time to market. Also, the other question that we ask is how do we process data? So we need to be scalable, have a guaranteed performance, okay? And we do not want to have a separate tool for every task in, in every cloud environment. It's like we have multiple tools, uh, solutions for actually almost every problem that exists, but that is meaning that besides the spreading of data, it's also spreading of tools, which making it much more complex. Um, how do we want to serve our users? Well, we want to serve them with a one virtual semantical layer, and we want lots of functionalities to support them really. And also very important, we want a data catalog that where we can actually give our users insight on which objects from a technical, but also from a business perspective are available for them. And we want to give them the data in any format, as long as it's the same data, but we can change the format on the fly. Well, on daily operations and keeping costs low, we want to have one familiar language. So um, in this case, it's SQL for single store. It's also on SQL for data virtualization. Uh, be able to use stream and batch um, and, and also break down that, that barrier uh, that, that eight step is uh, giving us. So we want to mix and match OLAP and OLTP. And finally, we want a flexible cloud strategy. Not every customer is ready for the uh, cloud already, uh, but they have a lot of on-prem. So we wanted a solution that we can run fully on-prem. You can run it at almost everywhere. You can run it in your own cloud or in the public cloud. So what's our challenge? Our challenge is actually that we have a lot of data sources, which we all want to connect to that single point of access for all that data. So whether it are package apps, uh, if it's your master and reference data system, uh, cloud sources, IoT, streaming, batch, and we want to mix and match that all and integrate it well via a single point of access for all the data. So we can actually provide it to multiple personas. And the multiple personas have shifted through time because we are seeing that business intelligence is still a, a large user group, but also the self-service analytics, which require a lot of 
insight in the data and especially the metadata to support these type of users. Uh, the growing group of data science probably want all the data, but you want to orchestrate that really good. Creating 360 fields, transactional applications are more and more uh, a persona that we are seeing uh, based on our platform. So we are working with three principles uh, to start with. We say, okay, we have collect, we have process, and we have connect. Uh, on the collect side, it's we have sources everywhere, which I just described to you. So we have, especially the data lakes, we have external sources, internal data sources, and they are all ready to be collected. Okay, but then we need to process it. And to process it, we wanted to have a multi-model uh, process uh, uh, engine. And that's becoming single store where we can have stored almost, almost actually all data that is necessary. And we want to process it using pipelines, streams, ETL, and ELT. Sometimes we do not have to store it, then we can just stream it to our platform. On the connect side, it's um, uh, we wanted to create a virtual semantical layer with data virtualization. And to be able to achieve that, we were looking for a model which can be virtually built. And that's where we joined up uh, together with Genesee Academy and designed together the virtual ensemble logical model. Okay, so the collect part is about data source uh, points where the data is created at that moment at that time so it can be your source system or it is where the data is first made available for instance if you have salesforce then that's the part where it's first made available for you and we also want to know of course do we require to store that data if it's temporary or is it just streaming through our platform that's on the collect part really important on the process part we just do not want to choose per se one tool okay we have characteristics in our data and based on that we will handle uh, the data. So, for instance, if you have time series, spatial, relational, NoSQL, pairs, stream batch, all those actually characteristics of data are just functionalities in your platform, not a separate tool anymore. Um, as I'm a data modeler, uh, I would like to model all data in a relational model or ingest it just in a NoSQL key value pair way of stacking that data. And of course, we need to be able to calculate that data on the fly while it's streaming through our layers. Um, from the Gartner perspective, um, we like the concept of HTEP, which is the hybrid trans transactional analytical processing. And I will show you that in a minute. But that's actually bringing OLAP and OLTP together in one instance on one data set. Uh, on the connect part, we want data virtualization as a vertical semantical layer um, so we can directly get from process to the connect part and we want to centralize the access for all our users. So going to the data route, uh, the data route is a part of your actually of your data management. So it's it's not a tool, but it's a way uh, to create a flow through your organization where you can create predictable and repeatable uh, data flows. So you design them based on functions. Uh, we use it mostly of the time as, as a fundament to orchest orchestrate all our data processing. Uh, it's very characteristic driven, data characteristic driven. Um, so based on the characteristics of the data, we will actually design the solution, which is most appropriate on the processing and storage part and also on the connect part. And of course, it's use case driven. So the use case is determine what type of data that we want to process in our organization. So based on that, we have a couple of steps. We start with the data set where actually data is first made available for us. And then we have the procedures around the data intake. So starting with what type of data, what are the characteristics, and then directly dive into data governance. So look at GDPR. Does it have person data, personal data? Things like that. Do we have the data owner delivery agreement, life cycle management, stuff like that. Then in the next step, we will see, okay, we need to separate the data. We need to separate actually transactions, reference, master and metadata to start with, because if we have already master data available in our organizations, we do not want two copies of them. We want to see if they are the same. And if they are the same, then we skip, uh, skip the, the, the new one. And if it can enrich our master data, then that starts uh, our, another process for us by enriching our metadata. Also really important, do we need to historize data? 
uh, and to what degree do we federate or integrate data and we check if, if, the, if this is our first data route of course everything is null but if we have run multiple data routes then we know uh, from a fact okay this is something that we already done before so let's reuse it okay um, of course we align the use case to ensure the demand so if it's for instance if we need high performance if we need stream data to show in combination with batch data okay, that is something that we can design up front instead of working it on it uh, while we while we are already developing and an important part is on every part we add metadata so all data should be ready for consumption but also for consumption by the data catalog so we can add all types of metadata during the first flow and that's all designed in the data intake phase on the processing part um, we would like to use uh, scalable pipelines and the pipelines I will demonstrate them or show you them uh, on a single store perspective, but we want to connect to every cloud, let's say, uh, a data lake uh, and simply ingest that data. So read the data, make sure that you only read it once, things like that, and have a really fast ingestion and during that ingestion also be able to change if necessary. Um, and we want to yeah, use the right functionality instead of a tool. So time series, it should be for us, it should be just a table, okay? And it, at the table, it's just in our relational model, okay? And it has the characteristics of time series. And that's the same what you want to do with, for instance, NoSQL pair, uh, geospatial, relational. So instead of having multiple tools, like uh, the, the different databases for each purpose, we want what we call a multi-model database. It's one database, which has these specific functions just on board. And we can switch, uh, for instance, if we say, well, this data, well, uh, if, if we have a second look and we think, okay, we should put this in a, no a, a column store table instead of a relational store table. And that's all possible in the platform. Um, of course, we want to use a form of relational modeling. Uh, so we can do the classic tree normal form, or we can use the data fold or any other type of modeling that is convenient for you. Um, we want to be able to stack data. Um, so if you have a lot of data that's just not changing, but just inserting with new values, then for instance, the NoSQL key pair function is really uh, appropriate. And of course, enrich all data with the proper metadata and make sure about that we have all the lineage about its origin in place. So looking from the data storage side, okay, so the data storage will be a, a balance between fast storage and processing power, okay, not all data needs to be available instantly, but if you have a platform that supports both, um, then it makes life really easy because we want to fill that you want to use that data for virtual logical data models which actually require quite a lot of performance. Okay, so for the characteristics, where are we going to historize? Uh, are we already aggregating? Uh, how to deal with late arriving data, uh, the last version versus all the increment of a, 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 a data record? It's all relevant uh, based in this phase. And we, of course, need to meet all the requirements on scalability, cost performance. It's really good to start the project with a very fast environment, uh, but six months, 12 months later, it should be uh, the same performance or it should be scalable to go to the next phase with the performance. Okay, so and then from the access point, we determine now which parties, which personas have insights or can connect to that access point. So mostly this is where the data virtualization part starts for us, uh, where we can apply, for instance, uh, all types of security like row level, column masking, uh, other uh, anonymization, pseudonymization, all queries are, are audited for usage, our lineage is in place, and we can also determine the right protocol to distribute. So we can use JWC, API, ODBC, but it's the same uh, vertical view that we are distributing to all parties. So mix and match it together, and then you will see that we have to collect phase mainly on the intake. We have the process side on the data processing and storage, and on the connect very hard, it's in the data which is the access. So this is the linkage between the principles and our data routes. 
So why we use the single store? Um, um, people that know me know that I have a large extensive background in, in databases uh, and, 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 and creating these types of platforms. Um, so we were looking for a platform which really can support the past adoption of it. So if we have like the MySQL, SQL ANSI language that sure helps us to adopt the solution uh, much faster. Um, and, and we wanted to work actually no longer with different databases. Data virtualization is really good at having multiple databases with different uh, characteristics, but it's much more easy if you have like your universal storage in one database. Okay, so we can do relational column store time series like that. Um, also important that not everybody at this moment is using um, uh, the cloud, so we must run actually almost everywhere. And uh, it should be, of course, compatible with data virtualization for optimal performance to the end users, meaning that data virtualization must be able to write the optimal query for the platform. And the platform has its own intelligence to solve the query very fast, leading to a blazing fast performance at high concurrency. And fast performance and high concurrency were really the key issues that we are using. So how does data uh, single store do this? Uh, this is what is called what Gartner is calling the H step. Uh, so we can do actually in, in single store, we can have our transactional workloads. So we can have our all to be, and we can have our analytical workloads. And that can be on the same database where, and that is done by using it in memory functionality of single store. So it simplifies a lot of the tasks that we have by putting it all in one database. And in some cases, we only have to, to track some changes and no longer have a full data load of your, for instance, your transactional load, uh, transactional load, and we can mix and match that for the analytical workload. So how do they do that? Um, it, it's an in-memory row store. So for all to be, we can do this in memory and uh, Suki will later on present you some cases at customers where this is, uh, well, it's amazing uh, what kind of performance they can achieve Okay, but the in-memory is specifically for the OLTP and for OLAP, uh, it's memory and this column store, um, meaning that we can have a, a high compress ratio and have a blazing fast performance for uh, our OLAP. And it's all combined to one universal storage, meaning, oh, less ETL to no more ETL. We have simplified the architecture by having just one database, one solution for this, of course, lower cost and especially important lower latency. So on the left side, uh, uh, our keywords are speed, skill, SQL. On the left side, you will see the streaming data, which we use uh, the, the, the single store pipelines for. We can transform it. We can actually use a pipeline towards a procedure and then ingest it. So we can do, during the ingestion, we can actually add all types of metadata or even integrate metadata. And of course, we can also do the bulk load. That will lead to real-time decision on the platform. We can do some real-time on IoT, but also deliver all types of dynamic experience with end users. Uh, on the right side, we use, of course, data virtualization, uh, but we can also directly connect it to all types of dashboards, BI tools, uh, facilitate ad hoc queries or machine learning. And underneath, you can see that it runs everywhere. So how do they achieve that? So they have an ultra fast ingest. So they can do that parallel load uh, using the pipelines. Uh, they have a super low latency and high concurrency. And those are all top ingredients that you want to use for an amazing fast performance for your data and analytical platform. Functionalities that we are using, um, which are in the unified database, it's the NoSQL value pairs. We have the time series. We can use procedure triggers functions like every mature database has. We can use geospatial, which is very uh, a very good extension on top of your uh, data analytical environment. And we can do the full text search um, where we will discuss this in the breakout rooms where we have to discuss a use case on top of this. On the pipeline part is uh, functionality where you can, for instance, directly connect to Amazon S3, Azure Blob, file system, Google, all those types of file systems natively, JSON, Afro Parquet, and CSV is supported. And I think that the most important part is that you can run this massively parallel, um, but also with the exactly one semantics. And that is meaning that 
the single store instance with the pipelines will track which files are already processed. So for instance, if you have your IoT, which sends out uh, all the files towards your data lake, okay, then the, the pipelines with the exactly one semantics can exactly see, oh, this is something we already ingest and this is new, new, new. So, and you can leave it run constantly. So you have real, real time data, or you can do this uh, scheduled in batch format. So bringing it all together, um, before I hand it over to Philip, um, these are the data routes and, and this is the first explanation why we use single store for this uh, universal storage part and have uh, one database which actually collects all the data that we need. And I would like to hand it over for Philip to give us the presentation on the other part. Philip. Hey, thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Okay, um, I think Antoine, can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Uh, yeah, I, I can see it. You're great, Philip. Okay, thanks, great. So thanks Antoine. Um, Antoine told us something about uh, the, the data routes and about single store. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you something more about data visualization, uh, about Elm and about the virtual Elm that, we, uh, that we've created basically. Uh, so these are the next steps. Uh, to start off, um, a bit about data virtualization. Um, data virtualization is um, something where you, uh, where you separate compute and storage. Um, the storage of your data um, um, will be the source systems itself. We don't have to get all the data from our source systems um, in separate databases. Now we just leave it in there um, and the compute. So the, so the compute when we access the data, uh, will be done within virtualization, or even better, if it's possible, we can also use the compute in the source systems itself. Um, so we can use the optimal solution um, for getting data out of our source systems. So virtual modeling, uh, as we don't have any tables, we only have virtual models in virtualization. We create virtual models, um, and virtual models are based basically on all types of data sources uh, below. Um, and that's also why we use Elm for the modeling, for example. Um, so we can connect to every, almost every data source that you can imagine. It can be just a simple CSV file. Um, it can be an Oracle database or a SQL database. Or we can connect to any, uh, any kind of cloud platforms, um, um, uh, data lakes, etc. cetera. Um, so within the data virtualization, we create a security model uh, based on authentication and authorization. So there we say that only users who are allowed to see any data can, can access this data. Um, and data virtualization will be implemented as a virtual layer within the whole data architecture in an organization. This means that you can use this virtual layer as an access uh, a layer to all of the data in the, in the organization. So uh, one of the really cool features of data virtualization is that you have a, a lineage, a data lineage in there. Um, everything that we create, define, uh, and model in data virtualization um, uh, can be lineaged uh, from every point within data virtualization to all, all sources that are uh, available in there, uh, but also the other way around from, from any view that is created, for example, to, uh, to every object that is published for the, for the users. It can be really handy, for example, if there's an attribute change in one of the source systems. Um, lineage can show you what the impact is downstream in your whole lineage. So further on, some more points. Uh, monitoring performance, uh, access by data users. Um, um, it's all set up. Um, um, all metadata, all logging is done. So every user that connects to the virtual environment and every user that, that fires any report SQL to the virtual environment is locked. So we can find, we, we can trace everything that has been happening in the virtual environment. And 
also important. It's a flexible way um, um, to, to create, but also to adjust your models. If you've created a model and you want to change something in the model, it's pretty easy to do that. You don't have to change all your ETL and your tables because there's no ETL on tables. You just have to change your virtual model um, and you're good to go again. Um, so from, uh, from virtual uh, uh, data virtualization um, uh, to ensemble logical modeling. Um, I just mentioned that we use ensemble logical modeling to create our logical models. Um, if you look at, at the terms ensemble logical and modeling, um, and just, just a quick recap. Ensemble is something that means a group or things of people acting together. It's taken together as a whole. Um, here you see a, a, a picture of a, a, uh, of musicians and a conductor. Um, they're all individuals working together um, um, had to create a, a music ensemble. So that's the ensemble part. So then we have the logical part. So logical, if you think about the term logical, it describes something that comes from clear reasoning. Um, and when you look into a dictionary, it says something about mathematical precision and removed from emotion. Um, so everything needs to be logical. Um, and there shouldn't be any interpre interpretable things about it. Um, so logical for everybody to knowing what it is. And then, of course, modeling. You have to model something. You have to model the business model. Um, so the goal of Elm is mapping the organization in an enterprise-wide business model. Um, and why Elm and why data visualization? So an agile, ball, sorry, an agile, workable, and adaptable model. That's what we need those days. That's what we need in organizations. Elm is really a useful way of, of modeling uh, in an agile way. Um, um, and also virtualization is a really each agile way to implement logical modeling. Um, just some core, uh, core things about, about Elm. Um, Hans can tell you more about it. Um, so one of the things that we see uh, within, uh, within uh, um, and ensemble logical modeling are the core business concepts. So core business concepts um, are basically the, the fundamentals used in the day-to-day -day operations in an organization. Uh, think about persons, think about events, think about things, think about places, or think about all the concepts. Um, these are the things that need to be identified, uh, discussed, um, um, and looked up um, um, within, within the ELM concept. So, this identification needs to take place. Um, one of the things you can use for that is workshops. Workshops are really a good way of identifying all those things and discussing them uh, to, to get a clear understanding of it. So besides the core business concepts, um, we need to have the natural business relationships. Um, what are the natural business relationships? Basically, the, the MBRs, they associate the CBCs together. So it's an association between two or more uh, core business concept. Um, important here is the natural business relationships. Um, don't automatically look at the data, don't look at the source systems itself, where also technical relationships exist. Now really look into the, the processes as described by the people in the organization. So um, bringing all together of the ELM in, in just one sheet, uh, just a couple of more things about, about ELM and the modeling. Um, um, so the core business concepts are the foundational business concepts that need to be created or need to be identified. And we have the natural business relationships, um, um, which are the, the, the net, which naturally correlate those, those core business concept, concepts together. Um, and to identify all those, those things, um, there are a couple of artifacts that can be used. Um, uh, using those artifacts as a, as a, as a way of working um, to, to identify and to document all those things. Uh, for example, the CBC list, the core business concept list, which is a list of all the, the, the core business concepts um, um, and also identifying what kind of category it is. Then there is the CBC canvas, which is a group uh, for grouping the CBCs together um, and, and investigating possible uh, dedubbing or missing uh, CBCs, for example. So then we have some matrices um, and forms uh, where all those uh, CBCs, MBRs, et cetera, can be described. 
Um, it's also it's always a good thing to use those uh, use these artifacts uh, within the organization. So um, there's one more thing. Um, um, but within Elm and within those workshops, you can use the the, the W questions. Um, uh, journalism has like for four or five W questions that they always ask uh, involving who, what, where, etc. Um, so within Elm, we have eight W's. I'm not going to into detail of all the W's, um, but these are really helpful in getting all the information out of the people um, for the Elm modeling. So from ensemble logical modeling to virtual, to the virtual ensemble logical modeling. Um, sorry, I have a sensitive mouse, so switch to the next slide. Um, virtual ensemble logical modeling. So basically what we have on the left side is information needs. There are information needs within an organization. Um, um, we have to do something with that. Um, and one of the things that we can do is create a logical data model. It's basically, the, the, the whole Elm, um, the, the Elm thinking and the Elm um, way of working, that's where we create a logical data model. Um, so, so that's basically the first phase. And when the first phase is, is running, we can start already parallel in the data virtualization technology and start with the virtual data models within, within data virtualization, so-called VLMs. Um, and why can we start really fast with it? Um, because it's all virtual. We don't have to create any tables. We don't have to create any ETL logic in there. Um, um, as we create virtual objects, they're also really easy to change uh, uh, on the go where we're going. Um, so with this via virtual data models, um, which relate to the, to the logical data model that's created, um, uh, we connect to the physical data sources where all the data resides. So we do have to know um, uh, something about the data sources uh, and the models uh, within those data sources, of course. Um, and eventually we end up with information products based on the virtual AMPs that we have created in the virtual, uh, in the virtual layer. Um, um, looking at an, uh, an, an, an example here, um, so a logical data model here. Um, um, and the Cora and the Vera are, are source systems basically from a, from a house rental uh, corporation. Um, and we use all the, the logical connectors to the, to the source systems to logically connect to them to, to create a data model, a logical data model. And eventually, uh, besides those, uh, we can also use files, all the data and cloud uh, uh, cloud data uh, to enhance the whole model. Um, so important here to know is that the logical data model can be can be developed modular and recognizable with the reusable ensemble. So the ensembles we create an ensemble or we create the core business concepts, um, and it's not only for one uh, uh, one target group, but it can be used for multiple groups uh, within the organization, of course. Important uh, the decoupling from technology and source systems. Um, the data that resides in the source systems, and only at the moment that we need the data, it will be pulled through the virtual data models. So it will be changed according to the virtual data models and presented to the users. Um, here, an example of this, this housing rental corporation. Um, basically, uh, within this example, we, we, we defined three core business concepts. So we have the real estate units, we have the agreements, and we have relations, uh, meaning a relation can be a, a person who is renting a real estate unit. And of course, they have to sign an agreement for that. Um, so they're represented as a pentagon here. Um, and every pentagon has one or more um, detailed information items around it. So we need a business key to uniquely identify the, the, the core business concept itself. Uh, we have a lot of other attributes around it, um, um, giving me more information about it. And also what is important here within a VL, we also include all the natural business relationships that are needed to connect to all the CBCs. Um, so more looking into the, um, the data virtualization layering, 
uh, and how we are implementing it. Um, uh, on the bottom side here, you see the, the basically your, your source layer, meaning we have a single store, of course, here for the for the for the big data for the processing, etc. For example. But besides that, we can also use files uh, and other external sources. Um, uh, within most organizations, it's not only one source that we that we get the data from. No, there are multiple different sources. Um, so the data is coming from all those sources, and they're virtually um, showing in the business layer. So the virtual business layer here is basically your business model that is created. Um, um, here represented by a couple of uh, core business concept objects, which are uh, basically views that are created. Um, and on top of this virtual business layer, where you, where you create your business model, there is this virtual publication layer. So the publication layer is basically the layer which is accessible for um, for, uh, um, for 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 uh, analytics tools for uh, people in your organization, or maybe maybe even outside of the organization. And that's where you create your virtual uh, publication models um, and those models really use data from the virtual business layer um, so regarding those virtual products that we create there's a lot of flexibility um, as i mentioned a couple of times before already um, it's all based on views on virtual objects um, and changes can be made instantly um, and by developers, for example, um, using the lineage, we can not only see what the impact of the change is, um, but also because it's virtual and it's all uh, um, metadata stored in the repository. If you change anything within uh, within one of the objects, it's automatically reflected in all the objects related to it. So we don't have to change that by hand anymore. Um, so the data model is expandable. We can start start really small, and we can expand it um, as long as we need. Um, and the data sources, I explained them already. And, and most, of, almost every single data source can be accessed by uh, by the virtualization environment. Um, so bring it all together, and more focus on on the terms that we have had here. So on the bottom, in the virtual source layer and the virtual data layer. We have um, uh, we start with the data routes, uh, basically what Anton was telling uh, the data routes from where is the data coming from and how is the route of the data going. Then we have single store and other files, other external sources or internal sources that we use. Um, and all this data is being combined in the virtual business layer where we create core business concepts, where we create a national business relationship between those core business concepts. And eventually in the virtual publication layer, we create objects um, which combine uh, data from uh, from the virtual business layer objects. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you, Antoine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's wrap it up with our session before we go to the Q and A. Um, we have seen now that we use a concept data routes just to design our data flows and actually to be really starting that data governance point before the data hits our organization. Uh, so we are ready for this data. Then we saw in the process and the storage layer that we are able to process any data with any functionality uh, using the single store, making our weapon of choice quite simple and have that universal uh, storage and that simplified architecture of single store using this, uh, we can enhance almost every platform uh, with performance speed, but also that it is a much more simplified architecture. And that is a solid base uh, to use data virtualization, which you can imagine if you want to query live, uh, for instance, data marks uh, without physically storing them. Then of course you need a lot of processing power and you need a system like data virtualization which is able to create the optimal query towards the platform and we also adopted the logical modeling uh, because with this type of power combining those two uh, we are now able to well give you logical models with data which are very well recognized by end users and, and other personas so this is for us an, a, a really 
a good way to proceed. Um, and also the request more and more for working with data catalogs, although the data catalog is not a direct function of uh, our platform, we are compatible with any data catalog because data virtualization can harvest all the metadata that is provided by single store on the pipelines. It's all by default there and within the data virtualization environment. So we can push it out with an API and bring it to any data catalog. Um, from single store sponsor, we have a, a special trial for you. It's a $500 free credits and which you can use uh, on their SaaS platform. Um, and it's actually a database as a service. So you do not have to install anything. You just run it and you can use it uh, with a credit of $500. It's especially for uh, the Global Data Summit. They have their own documentation, which is, is, is on a quite mature level, um, but they also have a great academy online where you can follow uh, training uh, for free and you can also learn from the examples that they are showing. Um, after this presentation, the Global Data Summit will send you our complete presentation by PDF and you also can find uh, the link to the single store free trial. So I think I have to give it to Hans for the Q&A. Hans? I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Antoine. Thank you, Philip. Appreciate it. Um, that's uh, that's great. So we don't. Uh, let's see. We have one or two questions coming up now. Um, maybe if we can, Laura, can you unmute uh, Shores Takis for us? Um, yes, I will turn on. So. Shores, can, you can unmute yourself now. Okay, hello there. Hi, Shores. Hi. Hi. Ah, video is on too. So let me get this shady stuff out of the way. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, what kind of uh, virtualization tools, uh, if any, uh, did you yeah. touch yeah. or used? Yeah, we are using uh, TIPCO data virtualization uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, we are a reseller of, of, of TIPCO data virtualization. have been working for five or six years for now. And uh, a couple of functionalities that, that really trigger us uh, by using this. Uh, one is, for instance, the, all the functionality of the single store platform uh, can be made available within the data virtualization. And uh, we know that in the new version 8.5, um, there will be a native, also a single store connection. Uh, data virtualization work with adapters, which can address a platform really well though. So they can write a query in the native language of a platform, which really enhance, of course, the performance. Um, and we have been using uh, typical data virtualization uh, for this, but the, there are more data virtualization tools which can also be used uh, on top of, uh, in this solution, of course, and on top of single store. Okay, I, I didn't get the name of the tool, uh, by the way. It's TIPCO data virtualization. TIPCO, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Also, uh, Sandra had a question about the dynamic experience, which Suki already answered in the chat. You can see it there. Um, Sandra, did you have anything else you wanted to ask? And a little bit, and uh, I got the answer, so it's clear. Thanks. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. think to addition to that, in Suki's presentation, you will also see um, how large companies are using the dynamic experience, like Uber, uh, using single store. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And then for the rest of the audience, is there anything else that came up for a question? You can, I believe, Laura, correct, they can unmute themselves now if they want to ask. Correct. Perfect. Okay. Open mic, scary times. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, how does a single store compare to Snowflake, for example? That's a good question. Suki, can you perhaps answer that one? Yeah, 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 I can. Uh, yeah, good question, Soz. Uh, uh, Snowflake does seem to be flavor of the month at the moment. Um, they're doing a great job uh, at, um, uh, you know, general data warehouse as a service. So there's a few things that we do really well. Uh, the first thing, we, we are hybrid. So there is this kind of concept of organizations 
that have use cases where they want to keep some data local and not and not put everything in the cloud, uh, uh, especially across Europe and and, and different different uh, industries. So we are hybrid. The second is the architecture is very very different. I'll talk about a bit about this in the next ten minutes. But we do we do have this very kind of strict uh, transactional row store pinned into memory and column store, which is kind of memory and disk backed. So, so the, the, the architecture is actually very, very different. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about the value of, of doing that uh, a bit, uh, well, in the, next, in the next couple of minutes, but it is architecturally very different. Okay. Well, looking forward. Thanks, Suki. Thanks. Okay, la last call for other uh, questions from the group. There is one that just popped up in the chat. Ah, can we consider Snowflake is cloud data warehouse, but single store is hybrid, i.e. on-premise and cloud? That's correct. Yep. Excellent. OK, well, uh, as I'm just kind of recapping this, uh, you can also um, ask another question if you have it. Um, Right now, we're going to head into about 10 minutes with uh, Suki to go through some more details on single store. And I think several of these questions have come up concerning that anyway, so that's good. Suki, thanks. Uh, as soon as that's over, we'll go into the three breakout rooms. So you can kind of set your timer for 10 minutes. And at that time, uh, we'll be getting into uh, the three different uh, breakout groups. So again, group, group one will be uh, Antoine and Philip uh, to continue their discussion on what they've done with routes. Uh, group two will be uh, Suki and team. So you'll have additional uh, players with you from single store, I believe, uh, yep. for additional questions there. And then in group three, you can see me and also you can see John Carpenter from Global Data Summit will be there together and address any other questions on uh, the summits and or also about the uh, Elm side of it from the GA perspective. So um, without any additional questions, why don't we go ahead and uh, Suki, you can uh, start off your presentation. That would be great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to uh, just going to present my slides. Uh, let me know if you can see my uh, screen. Uh, yeah, we see. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great presentation uh, by Antoine and Philip. Uh, thank you, Hans, for the for the intro. Um, uh, this this is really easy for me. I think it's unusual, but uh, but uh, uh, Anton has done a great job of going into some of the details around uh, single store. Uh, it almost feels as though I'm 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 like the support act for uh, for what Antoine uh, has done. Um, uh, but let me just introduce myself. My name is Suki Sandar. I look after the international pre-sales teams, technical pre-sales teams uh, for single store. Um, I've got about three slides. I'll talk to you a bit about, a bit about the, the, the differentiation, actually one of the questions uh, which was asked. Um, and then I'll dip into you know, the value of that differentiation and then use cases. So not, 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 not too much, not too long, uh, but uh, hopefully you can, uh, you can take some key messages away with you. What I've tried to do is I've tried to, based on what Antoine presented, um, I've prepared some really kind of summary elements of uh, of what uh, of what Antoine has said. So I've pulled out some some of the some of the nuggets uh, for you, and this is the first thing. This is the, in the exact summary. I would I would kind of pull this pull this uh, thread out of the discussion uh, for you to take away. Uh, single store is a unified uh, database. What does that mean? Um, it means we're, we're combining two very different worlds uh, here. And this is, this is the uniqueness um, uh, of single store. We do have uh, 13 patents, patents, sorry, uh, it's Europe. Uh, those, those patents are all, all around the bringing together of, 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 of architecturally a, uh, an operational transactional uh, database, which is designed very differently 
then a database for slicing and dicing large scale data, which is typically a data warehouse architecture. So this, this, is, this is why we refer to ourselves as a unified database. I think uh, Antoine quite rightly called this a HTAP, a hybrid transaction application processing uh, database, which is the name that Gartner gives uh, to this kind of combination. Uh, actually, Forrester gives gives another name. They they combine the transactional and transactional and analytical word, and they and they call it translytical uh, databases. So we're a unified database, which uh, which other people kind of refer to this as either HTAP or translytical databases. Architectural, this is very different, uh, very different uh, in a in a few ways. There's this concept of uh, universal storage or dual store, which is during design time, the, 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 the architects uh, can, create, can create a table and you can, you can either create that table as a, as, a, as a row store table or as a column store table. And you're really thinking about you know, how, that, how that table is going to be used. Is that, is that table going to be pinned into memory? And typically that's used for high speed ingest and making that data available as quick and as fast as possible. Um, to uh, to applications and dashboards, uh, to analytics tools, etc. So the, the the design of the row store is to pin everything in memory, and then and then column store is column store is all about slicing and dicing data. It's an optimized, compressed uh, 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 data set uh, in column store. Um, uh, but it's a, it's this combination. Now, when you're combining when you're combining this architecture. A few kind of things are happening here. Uh, if I could kind of, you know, dip into the next level of detail. The first is typically, typically the way this is done is it's a multi-layered architecture, which um, which organisations put in place. So let me explain that. Data will typically land into an operational data store. Uh, those are databases. Typically, could be a, a S3 in the cloud, but there's there's kind of many other databases that can be used as an operational data store. So, so source applications uh, and events will land into these operational databases, operational data stores. And then, and then what many uh, organizations and architects will do is they'll run that data through an ETL process. So they'll export, transform and load that data into another space, which is a data warehouse or uh, an analytics database for that data then to be sliced and diced. Um, uh, by either applications or, or analytics tools. What we're doing here is we're collapsing that space into a single space by combining these two, 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 two architectures. So what, what we're doing here and the value of that is uh, it's a simplified architecture. You no longer have kind of separation between, you know, these, these layers between what people are looking at in terms of the data for analytics, data for, for, uh, for applications and the, the, the data being streamed into, into your applications. Um, it means we're, ex, you know, we're pushing out and pulling into the database this kind of ETL uh, uh, component, a subset of that into the database in database ETL. And that optimization and rationalization means no more separate teams, no more separate skills. It's a, it's a, it's a unified database, which means it provides you that kind of lower cost and lower latency in terms of every time you're moving from one architecture to another, one database to another, one layer to another, you're adding at least an hour or, or many hours uh, to, to the latency. And by the time the data kind of turns up at the applications that want to see it, it's, it's many hours, many days, even old sometimes. Um, the, 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 the prime kind of characteristics for, for single store are these four. It is mixed workload. Um, as has been said, we, we stream data directly into a database. And that's quite different to what, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, other, other architectures will do. Uh, we are combining different kind of data types. Uh, uh, instead of getting best of breed databases, best of breed uh, document database, best of breed time series, geospatial, we're, we're kind of, we're bringing all of these together and running kind of full text search, mapping these to tables and allowing you to search it. Uh, we're built for low latency, high concurrency uh, querying. We are hybrid and uh, uh, particularly useful for kind of large data sets using ANSI SQL. 
here's some here's some use cases. And um, what I've tried to do here, and the reason why I've got these is I've tried to draw out some of the characteristics of what I've just told you about in terms of the the you know the the, the sweet spot for us. Um, and these uh, and these uh, use cases. Uber is a great example of whereby you're mixing kind of data types, geospatial data with other data types, and then having a high concurrency to access exactly the same data without having to replicate that data into different views or different databases. Um, so we don't we don't lock we don't lock tables as you're streaming data in. We're not locking tables. We're using uh, multi-version currency control at a row level uh, to allow analytics and, and, and anybody that wants to view that data to continue viewing that data whilst you're writing to it. Um, we talked about low latency a lot. Uh, here's the kind of low latencies, the predictable latencies that we ensure 50 milliseconds. The milliseconds area is, is, is you know, where we're, where we're heading for our execution. Uh, a great, again, a, a key differentiator for us is that predictable low latency uh, response times for, for, for a good uh, customer experience. Comcast is a great example of, of streaming um, uh, JSON data events directly into single store and then, and then processing them. The way we, the way we stream uh, Kafka events in, for example, in a highly parallel manner, we map to the kind of the way uh, Kafka as a, as, a, as a technology allows you to distribute and subscribe to different uh, different messages. So we have parallel ingest, and that's what people call like Comcast are doing. And then they're using that data to distribute it to different teams without again having to replicate it, single view of the of the data across to multiple teams. The energy company and Akamai, great examples of kind of adding large streams of data, but also gives you an example with Akamai, the amount of uh, upserts that can be done, the speeds and feeds um, at 10 million upserts per second directly into the database whilst you're running uh, analytics, which is that kind of combination that we, uh, we're very strongly pushing. And I'll end up, um, what's the value of that? You're accelerating the speeds of the applications and dashboards at least by 10, maybe 100x. We're taking out, we're streamlining and stripping out this kind of adi these additional layers like ETL which means the insights, the data kind of turns up in your analytics views much faster, much quicker than you would have done before. So the summary is kind of lower costs, um, uh, 10x the performance at a third of the cost compared to some of the, some of the other databases that we see. And with that, my 10 minutes are up uh, and I'll hand back to, uh, to the team. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your valuable time. Thank you, Suki, appreciate it. That's great. Okay, um, Laura, I think we can now at this point move into those uh, breakout rooms. So please, uh, each of you can decide where you would like to head to chat a little bit more. Um, again, first room, Antoine and Philip, and the second room, Suki and team from Single Store, and then John and myself in, in uh, the third room. And uh, yeah, you can bounce in between them apparently as well. So whatever you'd like to do is fine. Okay. Yeah, so I will open up the rooms right now. Again, you can select which room you would like to go to, or if you want to go to multiple, just um, you can make that transition. If you have any issues, uh, you can just let me know in this main room and I can manually put you into a breakout. Enjoy. If anybody in this room needs help um, manually getting put into a room, just let me know which room you would like to go to.